The fourth, last but not least, the fourth, they don't go in any particular order, uh, digital exit strategy might be that we, we as ourselves, create a new, a new human, basically, a mind that is able to deal with our digital mind extensions. And there have been very interesting studies in recent, in recent years to show actually the power that these digital mind extensions already have on our minds and how liberating it might be for our minds to, for example, deactivate them. So uh, a few economists did some very interesting studies there, two or three of them out there by now, that they motivated people to deactivate Facebook. So active uh, Facebook users, they, they deactivated it, and two very interesting things happened. First of all, people were much less informed. It shows you that people mainly inform themselves politically on social media, even so it's not the task of social media to inform you. The task of social media is to have your attention in order to change your behavior. That's, that's the business model, right? So, but they were also at the same time much more politically engaged, interestingly enough. Uh, and polarization increased significantly. Now, polarization, the idea is that the left and the right don't talk to each other anymore, has increased a lot over the last 20 years. So since the end of the 90s, it increased to, to a certain extent, right? So the left and the right twisted up, uh, drifted apart. And four weeks of turning off Facebook decreased this drifting apart by half. So it basically it reverted kind of like half of two decades of drifting apart in only four weeks. So that also shows you that probably our media landscape has to do with the fact that, you know, we don't talk to each other anymore because the like-minded is just a click away. So why would I have to talk with somebody who disagrees with me? It's just uncomfortable. So that is the first interesting finding. The second interesting finding is that well-being increased a lot. Happiness and life satisfaction for these people increased a lot and depression and anxiousness decreased a lot. In general, subjective well-being of people who turned off Facebook for four weeks increased about 25 to 40 percent as much as a standardized, standard psychological therapy. So if you're not happy with your life, you can take standardized, you can take a, can go take, take psychotherapy or just turn off Facebook for four weeks. You get like 40% of the, of the benefit. That was quite impressive. Or uh, this increase in subjective well-being is the equivalent to $30,000 of additional income per year. So either you could work harder, which might make you a little bit happier, or just, you know, so it's very interesting how, how big the effect actually is that these persuasive technology and social media already have uh, over us. And you can, you know that yourself. Right? You know that yourself, the effect that they already have on you. For example, remember the last time you actually you really wanted to go to bed because you had to go to bed, bed because you were tired and you had to sleep and you, you didn't sleep enough. So, but before you just wanted to watch this one YouTube video or check this one social media post that just came up or be it TikTok or Snapchat or Facebook or whatever, this one little thing you wanted to, to check on. And then two hours later, you just like, or emerge from a digital black hole that you were sucked into and you're like, man, I really wanted to sleep. Now I again spent this entire evening or, or the same can happen with studying or with working, which you actually do not want to, but against your will, it kind of like dragged you down this digital. And, and how did that happen? You know how that happened? Well, there was a supercomputer pointed at your brain. A supercomputer that knows many aspects of you better than you know yourself, it docked onto your mind or your thoughts, your emotions, and then dragged you down this digital black hole, getting your attention. Your little brain didn't have a chance, basically, you might say that. And some uh, technological ethicist like Tristan Harris here in the New York Times writes, our brains are no match for our technology. They have a center, the Center for Humane Technology, which works on designing new technology that does not exploit uh, humans through the attention economy. Now, for me, this sounds a lot like this entire, uh, this against your will, something happened. There's actually another technical legal term for it. It's called volitional impairment. It's often used in court cases as an excuse for somebody who did something really bad, but it, here's volitional impairment. Let me read you the definition. It's impulsive behavior, impulsive, talking about addiction, behavior resulting from impairment affecting the ability to choose to engage in behavior or to inhibit such behavior that is 
not consistent with the self-interest of the individual. Now, that sounds a lot to me like last time what happened when you and me were on this YouTube, social media, Facebook, whatever thing, and then were dragged down this. It was against our self-interest, right? Because we wanted to study or sleep, but that's it, it, it was basic. So it's interesting. These technologies actually are in charge of a big aspect of our minds. So what's going on here? Who is in charge of our minds? Well, let's do an experiment. Stop. Take a breath, observe, and now proceed. Where were your thoughts? Where were your thoughts just right now? Where were they? So who is actually with your thoughts? Well, the persuasive technology is observing them all the time, your thoughts, your emotions, and thoughts, emotions, I put them in the same bag, Kahneman. Again, the Nobel Prize winner, behavioral economist, he calls them thinking fast, thinking slow. So thinking fast, feelings, emotions, thinking slow, reasoning, right? So they're basically what our mind, different parts of our brain uh, and our, what we call our mind it does. Right? So who is in charge of your mind? Well, a quote comes to mind, which is from Viktor Frankl. For me, as a German, very important. He's, uh, it's, it's said to be from him. He's a Holocaust survivor. Um, and he said, well, look, guys, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. Now, what persuasive technology does, it kind of like eliminates this space between stimulus and response. Because that's what it's doing, right? It knows you better than you yourself in order to change your Behavior, get you to the next thing, condition you, and on this conditioning, get the, get the next thing, get the next thing out of you. So how can we then amplify this space that lies between stimulus and response? How can we take the power back, a new human, right? Somebody who's like more in charge. Well, first of all, it starts, I think it starts with getting to know our minds, ourselves. Look, guys, as I said now redundantly, these are extensions of our mind. If we are not in control of our own minds, if we don't even know our thoughts and our emotions and how they work and how actually what's happening around, how on earth are we going to be in charge of these super intelligence machines that dock onto our thoughts and our emotions and drag them all over the global internet? So it starts with looking in the mirror, looking inward and getting to know our minds, which extremely which are extremely powerful. And that's the first step of get, taking the power back here. Something very interesting uh, during the COVID-19 lockdowns we did with uh, some, some former students of mine, some studies for the United Nations Secretariat uh, in Latin America, a big data project. We basically monitored the impact of, of COVID-19 on the digital economy. And one thing we found, which was very interesting in Latin America, Facebook users, is the increased, the exploding interest in meditation. Now, what is meditation? Well, meditation is an ancient practice that exists in all world traditions. Doesn't matter from where over the world. Some count rose beads, some chant, some sing, some sit on a pillow, uh, some just, you know, walk or, or, or stand or but it doesn't really matter but meditation is basically uh, an umbrella term for getting to know your mind right there and there are many meditation techniques same as think about physical workout techniques right so there are some big groups for example in, in physical workout there's cardio and strength and in meditation there's samatha and vipassana and that did but anyways there are thousands and thousands of techniques out there but that's basically what they are same as physical workout is to get to know and be in control of our body meditation is an umbrella term is nothing doesn't have to do anything religious or even spiritual it just has to do with really mindfulness getting mind Full, be, being mindful of your mind, basically, right? That's sort of, and you saw that exploding during the COVID-19 lockdown. So in Latin America, if you take, if you take the left-hand side, in percentage of Facebook users at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, before the pandemic, it was 10% of men and 25% of women. And at the end of the pandemic, it, it, in, yeah, during the, during the end of 2020, it was over 40% of female Facebook users, uh, and 20% of male Facebook users. In terms of the population, that's 
over 20% of women and over 10% of men. So that's a, a, an amazing amount of people that suddenly got interested in uh, in studying their mind. And I, I do not think, even though I cannot prove this, but I do not think it's a coincidence. I do think the lockdowns that locked many of us down that also realized being being forced to interact with this persuasive technology realized, whoa, that's too much. We have to see. And it's very interesting. It's usually I've done, I've done these United Nations studies a lot. You find them in some countries, but not in others. In this case, in every country of Latin America and the Caribbean that we studied, that increase was observable. So it's a really, it's a, it's, it's a, a omnipresent trend, at least in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I do think, so that's the fourth part of our digital stra exit strategy, right? That we ourselves evolve the human mind and the evolutionary pressure is on here. It's on a little bit, right? So it's artificial intelligence. And we always thought like, oh, it would be the Terminator or the major, it's more like this. It's more, you know, the evolutionary pressure is on over, well, who, ha who is in charge of our minds? Who is in charge of our attention? And we probably as humans have to take up the challenge, stand up to the challenge and evolve a little bit further because if the human mind is nothing else but a machine for thinking and feeling, the future doesn't look so good because these machines are extremely good in thinking, in manipulating our emotions as well. So that's the fourth part of our digital exit strategy. All right, so these were the questions for today. We start, talked about the ethical downside of persuasive technology. Then we talked about to what extent it's already present. And in the social media landscape, it is, it is, it is everywhere. And then we talked about some, some, digital exit strategies of how we can well get the upper hand back uh, and, and, and get the best out of these technologies. And that's what ethics is, is all about. Well, thank you very much for being with me for your attention in the attention. I hope that your attention was, well, I, I hope you take your attention back and you're in charge of it. Thanks. Stop. Take a breath, observe, and now proceed. Where were your thoughts? Where were your thoughts just right now? Who is actually with your thoughts?